there has been a growing demand by opponents of fracking that the government abandon their obsession with trying to exploit shale gas. To ensure their success, the government has thrown more and more obstacles in the way of this opposition, from the overriding of local government decisions to proposals to weaken the whole structure of the planning laws of this country. No one has done more than Frack Free United to draw together the different strands of opposition into one coherent body that aims to unite residents, campaign networks and politicians who all have the common aim of stopping this abhorrent industry. We can see the fruits of Frack Free United's labours in people and politicians increasing awareness of the dangers of fracking and in the collection of thousands of signatures on the declarations about to be handed in to the Prime Minister. I find it astonishing that we have a government that appears to be able to close its ears to the barrage of warnings that are accumulating about the dangers of climate change driven by the burning of fossil fuels. The IPCC report in October, the World Meteorological Organization report two weeks ago, and the US National Climate Change Assessment published last week are all saying the same thing. Time is running out. We know that there can be no more exploitation of new sources of fossil fuels. Yet the industry is spending $100 million a day on exploration. We know that the cheapest way to generate electricity in this country is by onshore wind and solar. Yet these have been withdrawn. Ah, but we are told we do not subsidise the gas industry. It stands on its own two feet. Not quite. Preferential tax rates for onshore gas and the ability to write off 75% of infrastructure spending against tax is, in my book, a subsidy. Some would argue that the taxpayer pays for the security force for the industry. Two years ago, Mark Wilson, the CEO of Aviva, said all subsidies on fossil fuels must be abolished by 2020 if we are to avoid the mother of all catastrophes. This is a man who is paid to assess risk. That is how insurance companies make their money. Worldwide, subsidies on fossil fuels amount to $500 billion per year. That is 1% of global GDP. So, why is the government not taking notice of what they've been told? Perhaps they really believe that what they are saying is true. That we get so much gas from Russia that Putin could disrupt supplies by turning off the taps. That without frack gas, the lights will go out and the elderly will die from cold. That no one will be able to go home and cook their children's tea. A particular favourite with Claire Perry. I was, I was amazed last week when Claire Perry said in Parliament, it is said that fracking is this new thing, but in fact we have been doing it for many years. She has not read the reply to a question on this matter by Ross Lewis of the DECC, as it was then in 2013. He said, Quadrilla is the only operator in the UK to so far use high volume hydraulic fracturing. That was at Priest Hall, and we all know what happened there. Since then, applications have been submitted by Raftin Energy, Third Energy, and Quadrilla again. And of those, none have had a full, left on the full frack, 
and they've been halted or abandoned for safety or financial reasons. So far in this country, there has been a 100% failure rate for fracking. The government's own advisory bodies tell them that frac gas is both unnecessary and counter to climate targets. The National Infrastructure Commission in 2018, Gas Security and Supply 2017, and Clean Growth Strategy 2017. Yet the government say it is necessary to use gas as a bridging fuel to meet our targets. They know this because they have consulted with interested parties. There have been many meetings with the industry, but so far, no one has consulted me. I suspect that no one has consulted you. And I am absolutely sure that no one has consulted the 8 billion other people on this planet who are going to be directly affected by this continued exploitation of fossil fuels and the effect of this on their lives. The whole debate about fracking leads ultimately to the question of climate change. We cannot ignore the fact that if we do not stop the exploitation of fossil fuels, then the world will face unimaginable climate breakdown. Because of the high greenhouse effects of methane, fracking is especially harmful. It is alarming that the WMO report states that methane trapped in the atmosphere has increased to 257% of pre-industrial levels, as opposed to CO2, which is only 146%. The IPCC report tells us that we have 12 years to really make a difference. The World Meteorological Report says that the door is almost shut. What is certain is that the climate will not necessarily move along well-defined computer-generated projections. Tipping points are reached and, then, and when they arrive the climate can change at an alarming rate. About 11,000 years ago we came out of a relatively short ice age. It is believed that parts of the planet warmed by as much as 10 degrees in a decade. The IPCC report tells us that in parts of the world warming is much higher than elsewhere, particularly in the polar regions where most of the world's fresh water is trapped. A combination of melting land ice and rising sea temperatures will lead to flooding sooner and at a greater level than some are projecting at the moment. The recent US report has noted a rise in sea levels around the United States of nine inches since 1900. The Eemian interglacial period, about 120,000 years ago, saw a global temperature rise of two degrees, sounds familiar, but sea level rises of between 20 to 30 feet. And there was still ice on the Greenland ice cap. To justify her support for fracking, Claire Perry said in Parliament two weeks ago, we have excellent science, it is a perfectly safe technology. It probably is when you reduce the science of seismology to dropping bags of flour on your mother-in-law's kitchen floor. We have excellent science. The IPCC report had 91 lead authors and 133 contributing authors from 40 countries. They assessed 30,000 scientific papers. The Minister has called us a travelling circus. Our own MP in Rydale has referred to us as a mob. Others have claimed we are Luddites, impeding progress. With a remarkable metamorphosis a few weeks ago, we 
suddenly became a well-organised pressure group, <laughs> resisting the progress of the industry. It is thanks to you, to FFU and all the other people who in one way or another have resisted this industry, that we do have a chance of stopping it in this country and making a contribution to the increasingly growing demand for governments to act to save the earth on which we live. I will finish with a sentence I came across by the American writer Michelle Alexander. I thought it was so appropriate for today. We are not the resistance. We are the river they are trying to dam. They are the resistance. They are the minority, people trying to stop the flow of history. Thank you.